the collect questions during the whole thing. Uh, so if you have any questions, just send it up to that link and I'll be able to see that during the, I, we can uh, talk about that as we go. Uh, so that'll be on display during. Uh, so I'm gonna have Vince start off uh, explaining our project a little bit, uh, explain, give us a little background. All right, so yeah, I just wanted to start, it, start out real quick and um, just mention the fact if any of you know Noah, um, I'm not gonna like disclose any like personal information, but he was supposed to be in our group and he's not doing so well right now. Like he's in the hospital. So if anybody knows him and wants to like reach out and just like say something nice, like that'd be like really appreciated. Just wanted to like throw that out there. But um, anyway, so we did Southwestern University, um, kind of like an introduction, like a background on the case. Um, Southwestern University is a large uh, state college. Um, it's located in Stevensville, Texas, and it's about 30 miles southwest of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, the school has about 20,000 students enrolled. And just for comparison's sake, um, I believe the number that I saw for Rowan was about 16,000 students uh, undergrad. And it's a town gown school, which basically means that the school uh, is like the main focal point of the town. Um, there's more uh, full-time students in the fall and the spring than there are full-time residents uh, throughout the year. Um, it's an AP top 20 school and a big 11 conference member. Um, those are basically just like plays or like parodies. If you know anything about college football, um, like college football has an AP top 25 uh, school ranking. It's just an informal ranking um, to determine the college playoffs. Um, so they're just doing like plays on that. Like it's an AP top 20 school. Um, I'm thinking that they're saying that it's supposed to be a part of the Big Ten Conference because they're playing Penn State and Penn State, Ohio State, like teams like that are in the Big Ten. But anyway, all that basically just to say that they have the money, they have the capital, they have the resources, they have the donors to be able to expand their stadium. That's all that's basically saying. Um, they hired a new coach, which his name was Phil Flam. Um, their goal was to climb the rankings. They want to be in the national championship game. They want to, they want to be the equivalent of Alabama or Clemson or Florida State or somebody like that. Um, so they hired Phil Flam, and basically what he wanted to do was he wanted to build um, dorms for the players at the stadium. And um, they settled on a compromise. Like the, the president said that we can't do that, but we can expand onto the existing stadium. We can add thousands of seats. And he said, we can add like uh, luxury skyboxes. So that's basically what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be going through the planning of like the project management of how we're gonna implement this. So just to kind of wrap up the introduction, um, if you can picture the college football season usually ends like November, December, depending on how late you go into the playoffs. Um, so this was the end of the 2015 season and now there's 270 days left to go where the stadium's not gonna be used um, until the start of the 2016 uh, season. And Bob Hill from Hill Construction, he's the, um, the owner of the construction company that's gonna be working on this project. And he um, bid for the project, he won the project and he's a local alumni. Um, he's got good brand recognition in, in the local community. Um, he told his team, he said that even though we have 270 days in order to finish this project, he said that I want to be done within 240 to 250 days because, and, you know, I don't want to take a chance that we're going to run over. I want to be 75% sure that this is going to be done in time um, because they're going to be fined $10,000 for every day that they go over. Um, like if they go into the season and if they miss like the start of the season for each day that they go over, they're going to be fined $10,000. Um, but the fine, I mean, it means something, but it means relatively little because um, this is really about the reputation boost that they're getting right now because they're being associated with building this brand new stadium. I mean, everyone's going to be obviously talking about it in the area. They're going to have a um, huge PR boost, but that could easily tank their reputation if they were associated with um, being the construction company that caused the delay of, of the season. So in his words, he said that our reputation would be mud if we couldn't take the field against Penn State on the first uh, game. So then we get into the management of projects um, involving three main phases. The first phase is planning, uh, which includes goals, which in this case, our goal is to finish in the 240 to 250 day time span. Um, but the deadline is the 270 day time span. And we're trying to develop a work breakdown structure. And it's kind of hard to see on, on this particular slide, but we'll show you um, a little bit closer up the chart. 
Um, but that's basically just alluding to the chart, which you see right there. And it's very similar to what we did in class over the past week or two. Um, in project management, you can see like with the time nodes, I'll talk about that a little bit more later too. Like in the description, you can see all the different um, tasks that they have to accomplish. You can see the predecessor relationship. It's like when we drew those circles in class. Um, we didn't really talk there's optimistic timeline, there's a most Uh, Vince, I think you cut out for a minute there. Just like network charts. So anyway, so the third phase is controlling. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, yeah, you, so you illustrated through Gantt charts, you illustrated through PERT, CPM. Um, they're all basically just computerized network charts. Um, and then the third phase is controlling, which is monitoring of costs, resources, quality, and budget. Um, and there's plenty of these programs out there. I just named, like, we're all familiar with Microsoft Project because of class, but there's, I just named like four of them that seem to be like the most recognizable brand names. So we move into the next phase. Um, really, QPIC, I mean, everybody's done these projects before. QPIC's about like addressing potential issues. And one of the biggest potential issues that I saw um, was that they, in that previous slide on the, the chart, they list um, like potential timelines for all the different parts of the project. But if one of the projects is rejected, like for whatever reason, like they don't pass inspection, um, we don't really like account for that in our initial um, planning. Like we put, like I listed here, we put 0.1 days for optimistic, 0.1 days for most likely, 0.1 days for pessimistic, and zero dollars crash cost. So we're not accounting for that in terms of our cost budget. We're not accounting for that in terms of our time budget, and that would really throw things off if all of a sudden, like, one of our inspections failed because we're not accounting for that. Now, everyone knows because everyone's done one of these cases. Like a lot of these cases can be like ambiguous, like meaning like they don't really like explain things in detail and you have to kind of fill in the cracks. There are pessimistic time estimates for these things. Um, and that could include the inspection um, failing. But one of the potential issues I see is that like with material shipping delays and with the weather and slow worker out, there's so many different things that could go wrong here that I think the pessimistic time estimate has to either be increased, um, which I'll show you in a, in a new slide that Pessimistic time increase is only supposed to be like a 1% probability that that happens. So with all of these different factors that could happen, like obviously like we're living in a pandemic, so anything could happen. Um, I just think that this is a, a potential issue that they're not really accounting for right now. There's a question for the group. Uh, with this in mind, what are some other potential issues you can think about in a construction project in general? Uh, as I just mentioned, one of the big things we're talking about is inspection. Uh, and if that doesn't go well, then a lot later on cannot go well. So I want to ask the group, what are some other issues that you can foresee coming up any construction project? I would say like materials, like they could not be able to have enough materials because of like the pandemic and everything. Like there would be, um, like the demand is so high that they there won't be enough for the project. I think that's a great point. Uh, not even just for the pandemic, but just broader uh, supply chain issues are certainly something that we need to keep be aware of. Uh, does anybody else want to add to this? Right, I'm just going to move on to our next point, uh, being quality there. So this is about quality. Uh, this is essentially not necessarily like during the process of them actually completing this, um, like expanding onto the stadium, but this was initially like why they were co contracted in the beginning. Um, these are really straightforward. I mean, it's differentiation. It's the fact that Bob Hill probably has connections with the school, um, being an alumni, he has uh, str strong uh, brand recognition in the local community. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that his bid came in at like the lowest cost, but he definitely had to be on the lower end um, just from experience. Like I, I helped my dad out with his uh, small business and he owns a roofing company, does a lot of contracting work. And it doesn't necessarily help to be like the lowest bid, but you definitely have to be on the lower end. Um, and this comes through being able to have those connections of, of knowing where to source the materials, high quality materials at a low price. 
and being able to find labor because it's, you know, it's, it's tough work and not a lot of people want to do that type of job, especially in the, in the winter and, and during the summer, the spring and the fall are a little bit easier. But um, response, and obviously neither one of those two things matter if they can't complete the job in the 270 day time span, because that's kind of the whole point of this thing is not to bleed into the season. So then there's three time estimates in a PERT analysis, um, similar to time nodes. And just to refresh your memory, because I probably wouldn't remember if I were in your situation. Um, the time nodes were just like those circular things that we drew. Um, we had like the four corners and we put the different numbers in, like one of them was for ES, one of them was for EF, uh, LS and L LF. Um, so time nodes were just were like we were calculating like slack and we were calculating like critical path and, and different things like that. But like the forward method for the ES and the EF and the backward method for the LS and the LF. Anyway, we're trying to tie that into what we're talking about now, which is the program evaluation and the review technique of PERT analysis. Um, so within that, the optimistic time frame, like on that chart that we just showed you, the optimistic time frame is the time and activity will take if everything goes as planned, which like we said, we only expect the optimistic time frame to occur like 1% of the time. Like that's kind of flexible, like that's not like a rigid number, but in the book it says that it should be about one out of one, 100 times. Um, and so, and it's the same thing with the pessimistic time. Uh, the time and activity will take it. There's unfavorable conditions. So it should come about like one out of 100 times too, like give or take like a little bit. Um, so that's why I was talking about before that with the inspections, I just didn't see how like the optimistic time and the pessimistic time are supposed, are supposed to be like such remote possibilities like that they would happen that to bank on that also being included with all the other factors. I just didn't think that it was very realistic because the most likely time, the most realistic estimate of time required to complete an activity, like that's supposed to be the thing that's going to, supposed to occur like 98% of the time. And then moving on to the process within QPIC, um, bottlenecks um, are really important within the process because we saw before in the chart that uh, when they have like predecessor relationships, like when something has to happen, like for example, like if you have to pour the foundation, like if you have to pour the concrete first before you can move on to like say like the framing or like the wiring or anything else, like you can't move on obviously to those other phases until you pour that concrete, until you pour the foundation. So bottlenecks that could occur if something were to happen to that foundation um, that would cause us not to be able to move on to the next stage. So it occurs when workloads arrive too quickly for the production process to handle. Um, delays part of the process that serves as a predecessor to others. Um, so scarce resources could be anything from like this company could like a particular type of concrete material. And let's say like that's not in stock or there's a, there's a uh, breakdown in like the supply chain. Um, it could, they could have to sacrifice on the quality of that concrete or they could wait and it could cause a bottleneck because they can't move on to all the next phases because it's not, you know, ready for them to use. And the same thing could be for expertise. It might not be pouring concrete. It could be for an engineer. It could be something like that where the engineer has to work on a particular part of the project and they, they don't have access to that engineer because you know he might be tied up with something else. He might get sick or whatever. And there might be a, a, sh a shortage of those engineers like on hand for them to be able to use and they can't do that part of the process which bottlenecks everything up. Um, and then this shouldn't really happen with this project because this seems like a pretty high profile project relative to the size of this particular um, company. But let's just say, for example, that, you know, Bob Hill um, like has other crews that work other projects and all of a sudden he needs more workers for this particular project, but they're tied up at a different project. Like that shouldn't happen on this project because this, this is probably the most important thing that Bob Hill has probably ever done. But um, that could happen in a different project. So anyway, like moving on to waterfall and agile products or projects. Um, waterfall is where a project is like more defined and it's step-by-step step and the constraints are known. So examples of that would be like cars or things that have been done before in the past pretty often, like cars, airplanes, buildings, um, roads, like different things like that. And then we move on to agile where, where project is more ill-defined, like requiring constant feedback, adjusting. You don't really know where you're going to go. You're just kind of laying out the foundation and you're just seeing where it goes from there. A lot of this has to do with like software development or like different things that it, like inventions, things that haven't been done before in the past. And this is kind of like a sliding scale. Like obviously our project falls more into waterfall, but 
you know, it could be a little bit more towards, it's like a, it's a scale. It's not like a, you know, it's not either in one or the other. So moving on to inventory. So like, what if the cost of concrete, wiring, paint, any of these different um, commodity goods, like what if they increase over the next couple of months? Like, like it's very difficult for small businesses. Like, I don't know how big, we're making assumptions here on how big hill construction is, but like, what if like these material costs, like, increase drastically or what if they what if they fall like that's obviously a good thing but like you don't really know what's going to happen and small businesses unlike large corporations can't really hedge because they don't really have like the they don't really have like the capability they don't really have the knowledge they don't really have the, have the money to financially like hedge their bets usually um so if you overestimate in inventory you might order too much and then you might waste money and if you underestimate then you might you know, not have enough on hand and it might delay the entire project. So in this case, like you have to overestimate because you have to sacrifice on margins because you don't have a choice because we have to get this done in time because that's more, the reputation is more important than the fine. Um, so there are storage fees, potential for theft from materials left on job site. Um, I know just from my own experience, like you either store the goods or you leave them there on the job site and like maybe not maybe not like more so like within the last couple of years, but like I heard like stories back in like the eighties and the nineties, like if you leave material there overnight, like it can be stolen. Like it's, it's a real possibility that you just leave it there and somebody takes it. And then uh, finally for QPIC for the capacity, like how much construction can I handle per day? Um, like I already talked about before, it's, you know, it's tough work. And a lot of times it's difficult to find extra crews that are willing to take on a lot of workload during the summer and during the winter, just because the weather is going to be pretty brutal, like especially in Texas, maybe during the summer, um, but even winter, like up north, um, as compared to during the fall and the spring, it's obviously a lot easier. And then exertion level required per task, like maybe, you know, you have certain crews or certain people like work more exertion taxing tasks in the morning. And then, you know, they let up a little bit in the afternoon and, and vice versa. Like maybe they have a day off in between where like they're not off from work, but like they don't have like the heavy strenuous tasks on every single day. So that's different things to schedule. And then scheduling like people is the same thing with scheduling um, inventory where, you know, the costs fluctuate because we're hiring part-time staff. Like we're not necessarily, we don't have a lot of people on salary. So, you know, minimum wage could increase. Um, they could ask for more money. They could strike. That, that kind of rolls into like, all the different potential problems that could happen when you're dealing with people, especially with, with crews and working like, you know, hazardous jobs, like strikes, injuries, and sickness. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. I'm going to transition a little bit into more into explaining some of the data points we have available here. I do want to remind everybody we do have the questions open. Uh, so a couple of things to look for this, right? There's 12 total activities. Uh, and then as we learn in class, certain activities can be done before others, uh, but certain ones have to be finished before others can be started. But that means some, certain, some, some of them can be done at the same time as other activities. Uh, one thing that we want to talk about is crashing. So it's actually possible to make a project go faster, certain activity go, go faster by crashing it. Uh, for example, paying for overtime so uh, workers work longer, uh, paying for expedited shipping. Uh, things like that go into crash costing, but ultimately this is the crash cost figure that we're given to make a project uh, expedited. So here is our network diagram for this whole project. Now it looks like a lot of first for sure, um, but to break it down real fast, we have each uh, activity along the path. The red path is going to be the critical path, and the black ones is just uh, noting what comes before what. So for example, B has to be completed before E can be started. Um, then above that, you have the early start time, latest start time, early finish time, latest finish time, any slack time, and how long the project takes based on activity time that we'll explain in just a moment. So just break this down a little bit more. You can see uh, based on our estimates, the project is expected to be finished in 260 days as is. Uh, be mindful that the project has to be finished deadline in 270 days. So as of now, we only have a margin for, for about 10 days, and you'll see in just a moment how that's going to affect the chances of us finishing on time. So uh, the critical path is determined by which uh, which activities have no slack time. So that's gonna be A, C, D, G, H, I, and L. Uh, and that's a calculation. Uh, you see the latest start and latest finish where you really don't have any time to do, no, you have no wiggle room there. Uh, where other tasks, you have about 30 days where 
you can kind of push it forward or back a little bit and be all right. Uh, so with that being said, we can start the project as late as about the 26th day or so and still make it on time to the 26th day mark. But again, we it's really crushing the margins. Uh, so something we talked about earlier is PERT, which I find to be really interesting. If you recall back during forecasting, we applied different weights to uh, the weighted moving averages. It's kind of like that same concept. So here we give an optimistic and pessimistic views, each a weight of uh, one point. And then we give four points of most likely, and we divide by the total there, and that gives expected time. So that's kind of taking a weighted average of the different time estimates we have available and putting it all together. Uh, so based on the, the math goes, that goes into it, you don't really need to understand why that, that's calculation, so just understand that at this point, if you're gonna finish in 260 days, we have about a 64% chance of finishing on time. Uh, and that is affected by how long we're estimating to take. Uh, now, do recall that we are looking for completion probability about 75%. So now we're gonna take a look at how we can increase our probability of completion. Uh, so this is a chart I put together showing where we're at now. So as of now, like I said, we're at 260 days, meaning that we will have about a 65% probability complete of finishing the project. Uh, if we were to knock this down 250 days, we would be at 75%, uh, which is the mark we want to be at. That's going to cost us 15,000. 15, uh, and you can push it down a little more if you want to. Uh, spending just, just over double that and bring your odds up to 85%. Uh, so at that point, it becomes really a matter of how much you're willing to spend for the highest chance of completion. So how did I calculate that uh, 15,000 number? So let's say we want to crash the project from 206 days down to 250 days. You want to look at how many days are crashable for each, pro for each activity. Uh, so I've actually sorted this uh, chart based upon the crash cost per day and then knocked out F and K. They were the inspections because they're not crashable as we talked about earlier. Uh, so you, you want to prioritize tasks that cost less, you want to spend less money before you spend more money. Uh, so therefore we're going to be using the 15,000, I'm sorry, 1500 figure for activity A, crash that by 10 days, that gives us 15,000. If we want to crash it more by an extra 10 days, we've already crashed this 10 days, we can't go any further here. So the next task is going to be activity D, where we can crash it up to 25 days, we're going to only use, I'm sorry, only use uh, 10 days out of that. That's going to be 1,900 per day, add it all, all together. That gives you a 34,000 figure. So with that being said, now that was a lot going really fast uh, because I'm trying to save some time here. Uh, is it worth spending more money for a higher completion probability? As you saw, it costs about 15,000 to get to that 75% figure. Uh, would you spend that money and get up to that point? Or would you spend perhaps even more to get to a higher completion probability? That's a question I want to ask everybody now. And I promise we're just about finished. There, there's a lot of background work that goes into this project uh, just to get a few numbers. I think the option is, I think it was like 15,000 to get like just over 75% was one of the option that I thought was good because there's the one where you could spend like double to get 85 percent but like if you but, desire 75 percent I guess the so you're saying spend the least to get to where you want to be yeah okay I'm picking up what you're putting down uh, does anybody want to add to that all right so I'm going to go over what we recommend so keep in mind that we want to get to that 75 percent probability mark uh, we are keeping in mind that there's possibilities for delays of bottleneck issues, uh, stemming from supply chain disrupt disruptions, weather, and other external factors that Vince talked about earlier. Uh, there is a fine of $10,000 per day. The stadium is not ready. The facility, we, inspection has to go right. Inspection doesn't go well, then the whole thing gets pushed back, and we have to manage labor and manage our supplies really well. So with those issues in mind, how do we uh, respond to that? Uh, so we agree with you that uh, spending that extra 15000 I think, is a really great uh, great mark. For one thing, we have a better reputation of showing that we not only finished the project on time, but we were 10, uh, 20 days early. Uh, especially when you're considering that if we're late by even one day, that's 10000 there. Um, so what's, well, it might as well be early if you're going to spend the money anyway, right? 
Uh, timing is really important here. So if it's not, if it's not ready, then there's going to be losses in revenue and, and reputation for the university and us. Uh, so everybody loses if this is not ready. So let's, it's absolutely critical this, if this is done, it gets done on time and early. Uh, and we're looking for those delays coming up. Uh, we want to be able to respond to issues before they actually become an issue. So if we find out that one of our suppliers is uh, having delays, maybe find out another supplier. If we find out that workers aren't happy, we'll find out how we make them happy. And things like incentivizing productivity among workers. Uh, so offer employee perks. That's, that's uh, a really cheap way to keep everybody happy. Uh, free lunches, free beverages. Um, maybe have different events, uh, have an employee celebration at the end. Uh, we want to work with vendors very closely to make sure that we're getting our supplies as soon as possible. Uh, and as far as inspections go, we want to be ready for them by conducting our own internal inspections ahead of time to make sure that we are hitting all the points that the inspectors can be looking for. And we're going to be holding everybody accountable. That's how we're going to uh, stay on top of everything. Uh, be very present is what we're looking for here. So again, if you have any questions at all, please send them up here. But that is all we have presented for you today. I appreciate everybody staying a little late with us.